All right. Yeah, so welcome. We're uh, streaming live now. This is uh, the Regenerative Consciousness Rising podcast. Uh, my name is Jewel Bistrova, and I'm really excited that my good friend and colleague, Galen Myers, is here to have a conversation with me. We were going to co-host a conversation with Joe Brewer today. Um, unfortunately, he's had something uh, come up, and we are needing to reschedule him for next month. So uh, please stay tuned to the details for uh, rescheduling our conversation with Joe Brewer. And so Galen and I are just going to have a little bit of a conversation for y'all. If you feel like uh, listening in, we'd love to have you. And any thoughts you want to, questions you want to chime in on the, uh, on the live stream chat, you're welcome to do so or email to us. And... Uh, yeah, so we like to start our, our regenerative consciousness podcasts uh, with the idea that you know it's we're, we're thinking and feeling human beings, we're our whole selves coming into the conversation, and so just taking a moment of grounding um, before we go into our, <laughs> our heads, <laughs> and then I'll let you uh, introduce yourself, Galen. <sighs> Yeah, just feeling your body, feeling your breath. Just getting present to this moment right now, wherever you are, whatever you're doing, whether you're listening to it now or in a, in a recording, What are you feeling? What brought you here? Letting your breath deepen into your belly. It's getting feeling your nice connection to your body and to your breath and to the earth beneath you. really embracing this moment now this here and now moment celebrating who you are right now in this moment so thank you and welcome and uh let's begin and galen i'd love for you to just share a little bit about yourself now since you're new to the podcast and hopefully this is the beginning of many conversations with you live um because galen i will say before i hand it over to you that galen and i have a lot of great conversations on this subject so i'm excited to still talk with him even though joe's not here so handing it over to you galen thanks joel yeah i'm really excited to have these conversations as well we do always have wonderful conversations and it's exciting to, to be able to start uh, sharing them and get some other voices in um yeah so just a little bit about me i've been uh, part of the transition town movement for several years and I've been uh, been on the collaborative design council which is a, a volunteer board that advises uh, transition US I've been involved with the inner resilience network which is doing this podcast and lots of other good uh, inner awareness and connection projects and spaces and um, just a little bit about my academic background. I have, a, I have a really humble background, undergraduate in physics and biology, um, and uh, I'm, I'm very passionate about complexity science and evolutionary science, um, and uh, I've spent uh, all of my adult life in deep independent scholarship of uh, what I, what I view as um, kind of unifying scientific theoretical frameworks I see as the leading edge of science. And so I'm really passionate about um, some of those evolving worldviews and sharing them 
Uh, I think of myself almost as like a aspiring scientific journalist. So I'm really excited to digest things and, and share my understandings of them and, and keep learning and growing more. Um, and I'll just leave it at that for now. Yeah, yeah, you got a, a really eclectic and great background and, and we both have that, that curiosity and intellectual, the intellectual curiosity going on. And today we were going to talk about culture and ecology with Joe uh, Brewer, um, who is uh, well known in, in uh, the field of eco restoration and regenerative agriculture and sustainability. And he's got a whole movement that he's been doing. And so we, we are still excited to, to, to hear more from him. But, uh, but culture and ecology is definitely a subject that you and I both still are, uh, have a lot, of <laughs> a lot of thoughts around. So let's, uh, let's, you know, have part one of that conversation. And then, and then we'll, we'll have part two with Joe. Um, but yeah, we starting off with just like, well, let's what is culture what why culture and ecology galen why did we come up with that uh as a as a topic as a subject to talk about great well i'll share from my personal perspective um one of the emerging world views is an understanding of cultural evolution and that's um really joe brewer's work in uh in in communicating cultural evolution and scholarship in that area um, uh, had a, a huge influence on me. Uh, I think of him as a, as a mentor in that field a bit. And uh, so for me, the, the interest in culture and ecology uh, is in part uh, bringing awareness to a, rec a recognition of um, culture being a product of ecosystems, that, that uh, humans are not the only species that have culture, and that many, um, many things that we, we tend to think of as somehow different from nature or uh, things that are uniquely human, we kind of classify separately. And so for me, this is a big part of that is that there's a lot of developments in these fields. Um, and, uh, and regardless of that, the interconnection between cultural systems and ecological systems is is uh, obvious from any kind of most kind of narratives we can imagine, I think. Um, and so there's just rich discussions uh, to, to be abound here. Yeah, and it and it definitely uh, like like I, I'm hearing you say culture is like a, a culture as an ecosystem, um, essentially. And um, and I know one of the tangents off of this that I know that you and I are both really interested too is like how that plays into our stories and our narratives of what's going on on the planet right now. So um, I wouldn't mind going there a little bit if you feel like it. But uh, but yeah, kind of laying the grant groundwork of what what is culture, what is what is ecology, and how how are we defining culture and culture as a kind of a an ecosystem and that it has elements to it that are similar to biological systems is what you're saying basically absolutely and so from this perspective um a lot of that is directly related to the the evolutionary nature of culture um that there's actually darwinian principles that apply um to the way cultural information evolves in populations over time um, that are very analogous to the way that um, genetic information evolves in populations over time. And it has to do with a, a, a replication and selection process, which is analogous, but not the same. Um, and, and so there are selection pressures. And so a, a big part of this worldview is that, well, human culture is, uh, I believe, very unique in the sense that there's a lot of um, uh, intentionality that there's design happening um, and there's inventions happening and, and things like this. Uh, so it's very important to not lose sight of that. But at the same time, that because of all these similarities that exist with biological ecosystems, uh, there's, there's a lot to how the design of our cultural ecosystems arises that has, in my view, absolutely nothing to do with individual choices, that these are actually 
evolutionary systems. And, and one of the ways I like to highlight this idea is um, cities were not invented by human beings. Cities are the accumulation of inventions and practices and norms um, that evolved over time. And, and I don't think human beings invented civilization any more than I believe bees invented beehives. Um, but obviously, as I, as I alluded to, there are very important distinct differences as well. And so the way that that brings us into this other part of the conversation is that for me, looking through this lens, and I'm sorry, I'm getting a little bit of an echo here. Oh, let me turn off my mute. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, so for me, looking through this lens, uh, it, it helps me um, kind of identify the cultural landscape that we're living in um, and, and helps me think about, you know, why are these ideas better at being spread than these ideas? You know, what, are, what, are the, what are the factors that help certain ideas um, be better at making themselves into, getting themselves into other human minds? Um, and uh, and as this as this process kind of compounds on itself, just like in a biological ecosystem, over time um, the complexity arises, and you get you, and you get you know things like organism is not the right word, of course, but you, but you get these um, uh, kind of units of selection that arise that, that become entities. You get things like. Um, a nation state government is is like it operates like an organism and it, and it doesn't exist with all the without all these cultural uh elements supporting it um uh and you can get more abstract and, and look at just purely like belief systems you can see how some belief systems are better at getting spread than others um and so i could go on about that for a while but but how it helps us look at the the current scene um I believe is that we can see, we can see more about the the selection forces at play, um, and and we can see the ecosystem as kind of there's just in any ecosystem there's competition and there's cooperation that arises and we see these these forces kind of battling each other. Uh, people are talking a lot lately about. Um, there's a term going around, we're calling it the culture wars. And, and in my mind, this is what this is referring to is like there's this ecosystem of competition amongst different belief systems or different narratives. Um, and, uh, and there's reasons why some belief systems are better at um, spreading. There's reasons why some belief systems are, um, are able to last for very, very long times, but at a very low level in the population and et cetera, et cetera, so. Yeah, uh, yeah, that's interesting. I mean, I, I see culture as, I, I like um, what, what was coming up for me, it's like literally the term culture for, uh, say, in a laboratory, you know, you put culture in a peach, petri dish and to, to, to study certain things that, that live in that culture and, um, and so ultimately, you know, I really see culture as an, a, a uh, it's, it's, it's the collective um, soup that a population, a community lives in, that, e that they're able to thrive in, hopefully, you know, that they're able to, to survive at least in, and um, uh, in, a, in a particular flavor. You know, it's like there's a particular, like every culture has a particular flavor, look, feel, whatever, you know, just a, an essence about it, you know, aesthetic essence, all these elements, you know, that, that, um, that make that culture what it is, makes that culture unique. And everybody within that culture thrives and is familiar with that, whether they're thriving or surviving or whatever, but they're familiar with that. It becomes what they're used to. And that's that soup they're swimming in. And... Um, and so I kind of see, see culture that way, like a, like a soup, you know, and where it runs up against other cultures is, yeah, the culture, you, you spoke to the culture wars and it, it brought it to me an image of, um, 
There's a, I just saw recently an image of this picture of the water. I think it's up in the Pacific Northwest where there's these, the waters of the sea are coming in and the waters of the freshwater river are go, going out. And because they have a different uh, con, uh, uh, salinity uh, to them, a different kind of water, you know, and so they still have this division even though they're both water, you'd think they would mix, but they don't. And you could see this very clear division, even though they're both flowing and they're both water, <laughs> they still keep that division because of how, of, because of their molecular structure, right? So that what's happening at that division point, perhaps, I mean, I'm sure there's water that's going in, you know, there's mixing. And so we have that we have cultures that mix, but we still keep, there's still an intactness that I think happens as well and that continue, that perpetuates. But um, I don't know where I was going with that, but I was like thinking about culture that way as opposed to, I mean, I guess that that is an ecosystem as a, 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 is a, is a, a way to see it. Um, and as far as like the wars part, I mean, I mean, there's, there's like, you look at certain cultures that you go, there's no way I would survive or thrive in that culture, you know? And so then we, when we feel that way about a culture, it's, it's, there's a tendency, I think, for us to other, you know, that culture as being like, not as good as yours, because you can't survive in it. You wouldn't feel comfortable there. You wouldn't be familiar in it. And it just feels weird and foreign and alien. And so it's easy to make that like this culture that's not as good as yours or you know, something. And so I think that othering that we do with each other is definitely the source of the, the, the conflicts that we have. I mean, obviously, but um, I don't know where I'm going with this. Maybe you could <laughs> jump in there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There's a lot of really good, Good points you bring up perspectives. Um, one thing is so in in the some of the lingo I've gathered from cultural evolutionary studies um, is we, we talk about membranes, cultural membranes, um, and we recognize just just like in uh, uh, biological membranes that they're semi permeable, and so that's that's another way of describing exactly what you were saying about that that line where where cultures can meet, just like the river and the ocean. Um, so it's a it's a distinct line, and it's very meaningful uh, that that line exists in the ecosystem. And also, if you look closely, there's plenty of uh, transference across it as well. Um, and so when we look at a at a at a landscape of cultures or a cultural ecosystem, we can see where um, where these lines form, uh, and and uh, we can call them cultural membranes. And uh, I'd like to come back, I guess, later in the discussion, uh, we'll talk more about, uh, I think, ideas about regenerative culture um, and, and how I believe that a, a big part of regenerative culture is, number one, recognizing that um, a diversity of culture is crucial for a healthy ecosystem in a cultural ecosystem and a biological ecosystem. We would never go into a biological, most of us are uh, ecologically informed enough that we wouldn't go into a biological ecosystem and try to discover which species was the best that should be the one to take over everything. Uh, but I, I feel um, that for most of us, and I, and I feel like I can observe this in myself, even though I, I, uh, I have different thoughts consciously and intellectually about it, I feel for myself that there's um, a very strong tendency to approach interactions with other people, with other uh, talking across narratives or worldviews. It's a very strong tendency um, to be approaching the conversation as though if I want to be making the world a better place, it's my job to identify the right beliefs and then bring everybody into that. Um, and so I think with this kind of lens of, of cultural ecosystems, it's much easier for us to see uh, the importance of diversity and, and the importance of, of uh, uh, and the hard work that it will require also to get ourselves out of the frame of the culture war where we're trying to become the dominant cultural species um, and get into the frame of more collaborative relations across cultures and so a way that I like to conceptualize that 
is um, is by thinking of ourselves as stewards of these cultural membranes, and and uh, you know thinking how is my actions, how is my you know the information that I'm putting into the, the cultural ecosystem in this conversation, how is this going to uh, contribute to the facilitation of healing the inflammation that exists along those membranes? Whoops, yeah. Um, you're you're um, definitely uh, provoking some thought there that around, around well, f to a couple different things. One is um, uh, the, 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 uh, what is it that even makes a culture want to dominate another, you know, culture? And, and so for me, that comes back to talking about the soup that we're swimming in. What is that culture that's doing that? Like, okay, here we have a war going on, you know, and it's like, why does somebody want to come in and why does that culture want to oppress the other culture? And I mean, this is our, the history of the planet, right? Um, but you know, I've come from a place of just like trying to understand things in terms of our collective trauma and our collective healing. And so the soup that we're swimming in, whatever our soup is, is going there's going to also going to be unique makeup of collective trauma from that soup of our own, the his, history of our community, the trauma of our community. And that's in the soup. And if it hasn't been attended to, which in many cases it's not, uh, integrated it's not attended to it's just there and it, it influences our behavior and it uh, patterns repeat themselves because they haven't been healed and so it influences our behavior in a very powerful way these un this unhealed trauma and so we as a as a soup you know as a collective you know have that as part of our makeup you know to and so if if that unhealed trauma is un, un, unaccounted for um, and it's projected outwards. And so it's just like, okay, you're the problem, you know? And so it just, somebody out there is the problem. You've got to, and that's just, that's just what we do as humans and, and on an individual level, but we also do it on a community and a collective level. So, um, so I really feel like the, like regenerative culture, what we're talking about, like we've been talking about regeneration and so many different contexts. And um, I feel so passionately that we cannot be doing regenerative work on the earth, like what Joe is doing, which is awesome. And, and Daniel Christian Wall and, and many others that we've, you know, part of these circles of people that are just really doing this stuff, unless we're also attending to our personal um, trauma and our collective trauma, because if we don't, then we'll repeat patterns. Even if we're trying to put in all the good gardens and all the great natural building and, you know, so on and so forth. Um, if we're not dealing with that level of, of healing, um, we're, we're, we're keeping the culture unhealed and the culture, it's like, Kazu Haga, I love, he has a saying, I, I wrote this down, I loved it so much, is culture eats strategy for breakfast. And I, I love that because we can have all these great ideas and these great visions about the new world that we want, you know, the new paradigm, the blah, 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 you know, all these great positive visions. But if we're not healing the culture that we live in through healing of the trauma in the culture and our individual and our collective stuff, then we're going to keep being in that soup and you're going to, we're going to keep recreating the same conflicts. So that's, that's, yeah. Peace back to you. <laughs> Beautiful. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. Um, yeah, that all resonates deeply. I guess some of the thoughts that it spares in me is, um, uh, I don't know, maybe this is the conversation, maybe, maybe it isn't for this, but um, what it spurred in me was the discussion about applying an evolutionary lens to looking at these things. Um, and there's, there's a lot of understandable um, concern or even fear around, um, around using the evolutionary lens. Because one of the things that I, that I heard in what you just said was that despite 
having lots of really devoted people with lots of really good ideas working really hard to bring these ideas into being. Um, that that's that's necessary but not sufficient for for systemic change, um, and so to me that's that starts to broach on the discussion of um, you know how much how much utility does an individualistic analysis of our uh, cultural ecosystem have? Meaning, um, if I want to explain perspective. There, there's a, a term called uh, methodological individualism. And, uh, and this is kind of a classic approach to social sciences, economic science, um, to trying to understand the large scale be behavior patterns of a system by interpreting what the individuals are thinking and wanting and, and deciding. Um, and, and the idea is that uh, whatever is happening in the large system, it's always going to be made up of individuals making choices like that's and then what, what happens is is kind of the aggregate of that. And there's there's real truth to that. That is what these cultural systems are. It's a collection of individuals interacting. Um, but there's this idea from from complexity science and, and many other things where we're starting to recognize um, that a reductionist science focusing on the individual parts and understanding why, for example, why does this neuron fire at this time and not at this time, um, that, that is crucial information and could never be sufficient to understand the emerging dynamic patterns of the system. You could know everything you want to know about every single individual neuron in the brain, and that's still not going to be enough information to know anything about the thought that one is having. You're talking um, about emergence. Exactly. So emergent behavior. Um, and so methodological individualism is is what most of our social sciences have been basing their analysis on. And it's and it's an important and powerful form of analysis, and it's not sufficient. So there's this other level of how do we what kind of analysis do we bring? And I got that echo again. Um, so there's this uh, this other layer to the to the discussion that needs to it's very complex to learn how to integrate the two discussions um but they need to be you could talk more about that but there's another layer to discussion where we talk about the emergent patterns that come out of systems and there's a completely different analytical approach to being able to understand that layer and and all of that is is to get to this idea that a big part of that story, in my mind, in my worldview, is the evolutionary dynamics of cultural ecosystems. That there are actually selection forces at play. The same reason when we go into an ecosystem and we realize that uh, this species is going extinct, um, we don't try to explain that by saying, oh, all these, uh, all these toads are becoming lazy and they're not hunting hard enough, so that's why they're dying off. It's like, we don't try to explain that by the individual toad's decisions. We understand that there are systemic effects, there are selection pressures, and there's competition and all sorts of things. Um, and so just a little taste of what those selection pressures look like for me. Um, we were talking a little bit about, uh, before we started recording, we were talking a little bit about uh, um, kind of the tendency of the self-centeredness of human consciousness and the diversity of um, uh, how that expresses itself in our populations to varying degrees. And there's selection pressures at work in our organizations, in our businesses, in our governments um, that are actually selecting for certain skills because those individuals that have these kinds of skills are going to be more likely to succeed in these kinds of fields. And oftentimes what we'll find is that um, these skills are intimately connected to, correlated to, if not, you know, result of um, certain narcissistic tendencies. 
And so those, you know, we all recognize this, most of us recognize this in business practice and et cetera, um, that the ones that tend to rise to the top tend to be the more vicious. And, and I think it's very important to, to me, it's very important to recognize this as a selection pressure in the system. Um, whereas oftentimes we'll be really tempted to focus mainly on the idea that, uh, that uh, people are greedy and the amount of greedy people at the top is just an indication of, you know, the greed of humans. Um, or or I, I'm not thinking well at the moment, but all sorts of other ideas that are based on trying to understand the dynamic of how many greedy people are in power based on individual choices, which isn't sufficient. There's selection pressures making that happen in the evolutionary dynamics of the cultural system. And if we are, if we are to be sophisticated, um, wise stewards of these processes, in my view, we need to understand what those selection pressures look like and how we can affect them. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, I, I, I'm thinking like the, the selection pressure that you example that you gave, I, I was kind of thinking about that more as like a feedback loop as opposed to, and which is a selection pressure uh, feedback loop, but it's a, a it, it's what the culture produces uh, some um, just maybe dysfunctional element of a person that's produced by the culture, you know, like say for example, you know, we had for a president, somebody that was like the epitome of, uh, capitalist system, you know, the corporate capital profiteering, don't care about the person kind of, you know, system we have, you know, and there is, we have that in our culture. So it's, it was just inevitable that without checking, putting a check in place that we eventually have leaders like that as a production of our culture. And so that's a feedback loop because then that leader then really affects the culture <laughs> and can perpetuates the dysfunction within the culture. And so it sort of feeds on itself and gets worse. And then I think that's how we end up with dictators, honestly, and, and all kinds of despots. So is from that feedback loop. Um, and so uh, coming back to like, what is a good selection pressure? that where how do we actually really how do we actually really uh change a culture in a good way um well i mean there's this meme going around about the next sangha is not the individual but it's the community right so it's i really think that that is uh the way we need to, to um utilize this selection pr pressure uh uh consciously uh, that we, and, and, and I'm thinking of the 80, 20 rule where you, you know, if you have 20% of a population that affects 80% of the community. So let's say the community of our culture, 20% of us, you know, wake up and heal our trauma and heal, help each other heal and realize that we don't want to live, you know, with certain tendencies that we're just not healthy. We heal our own bodies. We come back into our bodies, you know, we're, we're able to digest and integrate um our lives and our history and our our ancestral history and all of this stuff and so we just need 20 percent of our community to do that that to really wake up to that and to do that and that pre that's a pressure on the whole culture that then can shift in a good way that's my that's my thinking yeah that all uh mostly resonates with me um the only thing that's coming to mind to, to sort of make an addendum of is um, well first first let me share that when I was talking about selection pressures on individuals and systems and you know we shouldn't be surprised that those are the kinds of individuals being selected for um, uh, I, I really appreciate you adding the, the fact that it's not just, you know, which individuals are being selected for, but it's also all the individuals in the system are being affected by this. Um, and so there's one, one of the key, uh, I, I believe, in my, in my experience trying to talk to people about ideas of cultural evolution, I, I find 
one of the key um, uh, understandable factors that leads to uh, resistance in the idea um, is that we, we have this idea that, okay, well, if you're talking about cultural evolution and things being selected for, um, then, then uh, you're basically talking about eugenics and, uh, uh, um, and you know, if this, if this individual doesn't have the right cultural characteristics, then, then, you know, they'll just be left aside to die. And, and that's not what we're talking about. Uh, and I'm not saying that you were thinking that just adding to the nuance of, uh, yeah, it, it, it's eugenics is something that's in, it's a, it's an idea. It's a disembodied idea that's enforced on a community. And, um, and that's another obvious feedback loop, but, uh, real shift, real, real evolution. Like we're talking, I mean, that's, um, it's great. This is where the conversation is going. Cultural evolution. I love it. Anyway, it's, it's, uh, I understand real evolution. I mean, I guess we're using that in, in the positive sense where like evolution is good. Is that what we're saying? You know, inherently, or is evolution the evolution as well? So I, I'm going to, I'm going to ask you that question, but I want to first just make this comment, um, to have real positive evolution um you, eugenics uh, to shift a culture i mean you do need to shift the culture you do need to have but it has to come from within the soup this is what i believe it's gotta it's it can't be an individual with an idea that's enforcing it that's the dictator right and that that happens and it does happen i mean it does shift the culture but it's not um it's not a real it's it's not um I don't know what I'm trying to say. First of all, it's not a positive evolution. And second of all, I wonder how much it really shifts the culture actually. But 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 anyway, to sh to to truly shift the soup that we're swimming in, like I just want to speak one more thing, to, you know, about trauma because it's such an important um element. And trauma is really just it's it's integrating into our conscious selves what's been unconscious. So it's not like taking anything in from out outside of us or any introducing any new elements really. It's 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 thawing out the frozen parts of our culture that have not been utilized. And so when we when we heal our trauma, we're getting more access to our our real the wholeness of our culture and so we have more to draw from we have more uh more diversity in our culture because that's just the nature of it so so that's the healing i believe and that that will drive positive evolution and and a culture might go on a different it might start looking very different you know as a result of that but in a good way so um so there's that change from within and that's the community change you know the, the the percentage of the cult of the community the collective doing that work and helping everybody helping each other do that work because this is this is just about the community right doing that and then and then and then influencing the whole culture that they're living in together and then the whole thing shifts and that that then you have that emergence right it's like suddenly it's like you have enough people shift and then and then all of a sudden everybody else starts shifting you see that happen in a lot of other uh examples right so in in how we how we do fashion i mean for on a minor level like fashions and fads and stuff like that a few people start getting involved and then all of a sudden everybody's doing it right so i think that that principle is at work when we are we're, when we want to heal on a deepest level of our culture so um I had another point in there, but I, th I think I'll leave it there and <laughs> throw it back to you. Cool. Yeah, that's wonderful. Um, yeah, the um, the the trauma aspect of this discussion is is huge, and I'm glad that you keep coming back to it. Um, and I and I agree with all of your points. Um, and the the idea of the tipping point. Um, yeah, the hundredth monkey is coming up. Um, yeah, that's absolutely. I mean, that's classic complex systems uh, dynamics. Um, 
one of the things that was coming up for me was so this idea for for me for something to be regenerative and and uh, you touched on it and what you just said it has to come from within the culture it has to be um it has to have some some realistic meaningful level of bottom upness to it um and uh to me that's that's a fundamental part of what regenerative culture means um is that uh is that we're we're trying to move from a from a space where a very small portion of the population is kind of actively consciously interacting with its culture um, in in ways to steward its health. Um, that there's kind of like a my view of our current context is that there's like kind of a professional class of humans that that do that in all sorts of different areas from politics to healthcare and um, psychology, all sorts of things that are, that are um, kind of a, a professional subclass of people whose, whose job it is to be contributing to the culture in a way that, that makes the system healthier over time. And I think a, a, a regenerative culture is one where, there's, um, where, where that's not a professional class. Where there is still a professional class, I'm sure, um, contributing to that process, but where some kind of uh, substantial portion of the population, some kind of average person in the population, at least has some kind of awareness and some kind of conscious intent to be thinking about how are my actions contributing to the cultural ecosystem, and and I think so. For me, regenerative culture is is it's the same exact ideas it's, it's all they're all together the the ideas of regenerating ecosystems are sp spreading very well right now i mean I, I think we should really appreciate the uh the success of cultural evolution in that respect where even 30 40 years ago you couldn't talk about environmental issues in public discourse near to the extent that we can do today that's huge that's enormous um, and in those awarenesses that are spreading, we recognize that we have a responsibility as an average person in the population to have some kind of mindfulness about how our actions are affecting our ecosystem. And that awareness is spreading. And I think it's the same for cultural regeneration, for, for a regenerative culture, for a culture to be, in my mind, considered a regenerative culture. Um, it must have the same mentality towards its own cultural ecosystem that I that I just described towards the biological ecosystem, where everybody involved has has everybody, where there's some substantial, meaningful portion of the population involved that has the awareness and the and the value of contributing to the ongoing health and regeneration of of the cultural ecosystem. Yes, yes, I, I, I agree. And that's the 20% that I was talking about is those people that are doing that. And, and in addition to them sharing that the ideas that are important and doing the work that's important, they're also doing their own self healing. And, and so it's, it's a both and, you know, where the kind of work that we really need to do to shift. So yes, um, we need to have that. Uh, you know, I was reminded it was when you were talking, you know, because we've been talking about kind of cultural evolution and then you've been bringing in, you know, again, the idea of regeneration and regenerative evolution or rege regenerative culture. And uh, maybe taking a step back here and like uh, talking to myself, like, what is actually regenerative? What does that mean? First of all, you know, it's like, what does regenerative culture actually mean? And what does regeneration mean? And um and I was just thinking about this earlier today, actually, is that because in, in, once again, in the, in the light, in the frame of, of trauma, like why is trauma so taxing on the system? Why, why is it so, um, why are we in this state that we're in on the world is because uh, we're in an, uns in, you know, I think everybody agrees we've been doing unsustainable, um, uh, we've been living unsustainably. So which means that we take more energy to keep things going than we, we give to the environment. So that's unsustainable. 
regeneration is you give more energy than you take it's there's a the, it, you you reverse that flow of energy and what uh it, it releases energy and it allow and that energy goes back into nature into the systems which which continues to thrive and and into us so and all life forms so that's the regenerative understanding on, on a thermodynamic level <laughs> but um but but understanding the element of the healing in this is that we have to understand that stress on our system takes energy trauma freezes energy blocks it so we're operating with only like on we have six cylinders we're only operating on two you know or something like that so we do, we can't even produce enough energy to get to regen to be be regenerative um if we're not attending to the stress level and reducing that and healing the trauma so we've got trauma and stress trauma is stressful but i'm i am distinguishing those two um because stress is huge and and most people i know these days are living in a, a huge amount of stress because there's so much going on in the world and and people um are just there's a there i mean we talk about the mental health crisis right now so anyway it's just most people I know feeling some level of stress and they're constantly just like working against that. So that takes a lot of energy out of our system. We can't be regenerative if we're always living under stress. Some stress is okay. There's the stress of the selection pressure. There's the stress of environment. There's the stress of interpersonal dynamics. Those things are part of our growth and that's good stress, but I'm not talking about that. <laughs> I'm talking about the kind of relentless stress where we never get out of fight or flight and we turn it we get chronic degeneration um so that plus our trauma makes it so that we cannot live regeneratively unless we heal um and so we need it needs to be a parallel process if we're going to do a if we're going to um have a, build this regenerative culture so anyway hand it back to you yeah absolutely and uh, you know, tying tying that in with the idea of uh, the the bottom upness of the thing, um, that's that's why I've I've been uh, so so passionate about the Inner Resilience Network and and wanting to be involved and um, and help out there is because in in my mind that's that's like the perfect uh, representation of of this of this need to start to put into place uh peer-to-peer -peer support systems so that we're growing these these cultures in, in cultural evolution we talk about there's a concept uh called cultural scaffolding and it's the idea that that cultures as they evolve they put things into place sometimes in physical material reality they put things into place um that that support the acquisition of of culture into the into the beings that are growing up in that culture. So an example is like um, our, our classrooms and education system is a cultural scaffolding. Um, also, uh, uh, there's all sorts of ideas, just just abstract ideas that could passed around. Um, not able to reach for an example at the moment, but um, it doesn't have to be physical things. Just ideas can be in place that can then help the acquisition of new ideas in the future. And so uh, I, I think um, things like 12 step communities um, uh, are examples of, of uh, kind of self-organizing support groups that arise out of a need in the cultural environment. Um, and, and people through these practices and connections and relations um, find ways to support each other. Uh, because, you know, before 12 Steps was around, the, the vast majority of people that were going through um, those kinds of experiences you know, they, they were going to psychiatrists and therapists and all, all those those things can be good things for people, but it's it's not sufficient because there's there's things missing in our day to day lives, in our culture, in our relationships 
Um, and to me, the IRN and all sorts of um, recovery groups and all sorts of spiritual groups, all sorts of things embody these principles of the idea that we need to self-organize, get together, um, and uh, and support each other, as you said earlier. Um, you know, this is a this is an individual spiritual, emotional health uh, uh, inner process um, that that you know I, I believe that must exist in community. You could you could argue otherwise, but certainly doing these individual processes, supporting each other in community, um, is far more powerful than it could ever be in isolation. Absolutely. Thank you for that bringing in that those elements and and um, and part of yeah part of our healing is like the, the way we heal is is um, sometimes just as important as the healing itself because uh, we have in place systems like you mentioned a few of them and we we had it we had a, our first podcast was actually on um, what. It, um, what do we call it? Decolonizing mental health or something like that. But it was just like, what is, what is, what are alternatives to the systems? You know, how do we, or, or do we change the system? But the systems were born out of this particular culture and way of thinking and way of framing the problems that we're dealing with, which, so it was a feedback loop. And then it ends up having a selection pressure on the culture, right? The, the system itself. And one of those systems is the mental health system. And I know our, our good friend Rob will have a lot to say about the mental health system. He just came out with a coming out with a book actually on on that. And um, and it, and but it, it's it met a certain need. That system met a certain need. And now uh, in, in, and now it's needing to shift. It's needing to change because we're realizing that, you know, the part of the healing is coming back to ourselves and to each other and empowering ourselves in our healing. Uh, getting the skills and the support absolutely we always need to have spaces for that um but giving but the old paradigm of that system is like fix me the fix me system you know something's wrong with me fix me please you know <laughs> give me a pill or something like that and and that has perpetuated uh the trauma in many ways and so we're we're, we're realizing that the system itself needs to start shifting and and that's you know i mean that's an element in what what you're talking you know i wanted to highlight in what you were talking about but uh but yeah that's part of our culture as well so we're needing to shift that culture i think yeah yeah coming back to what we're talking about thanks for you know just bringing in the iran again and just like saying you know this is what we're trying to do it's like this is the work in my opinion it's just that you know we're trying to shift the culture of the way we heal uh, ourselves and the way we he help each other heal, um, the way we support each other, the way we, um, I mean, and letting that go into everything we do, including how we organize, how we, how we build new systems, bringing our whole self into that, because that's going to be the really healthy, regenerative, vital culture that we want to build. We can't separate them. Absolutely, yeah. They they must be integrated and in parallel development, and and the way that our our minds tend to work um, often tends to be linear. And so there's this strong tendency to want to say, oh well, we can't do that until we do this. And you could make the arguments on both sides, and it's because in a complex system like this, things have things have to co-occur they have to happen in parallel and, and that's a there's a bootstrapping process a tiny little bit of uh development in one area helps a little bit more in the other and and they and they kind of rise together so this idea that like um it, it, at least depending on how we interpret the words we come across these ideas often uh like um well we can't we can't go and fix the world until i fix myself or um similar things you can you can even hear the converse argument being made is like yeah well inner growth that's all that's all fine and good but right now the the world is in such terrible shape we have, we have to fix the world first and then we can focus on our spiritual development and it's like to me neither of those orientations are are appreciative of the of the complex full picture that we're in 
um, it's it's just not going to be amenable to a linear process. They they have to co-occur and co evolve Absolutely, and 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 we have to just you know, there's a time and place for different ways of 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 doing things. And like, I wouldn't go in and ask somebody that's in crisis. They need food and shelter. You know, you don't start working on their deeper spiritual evolution in that moment. You know, you, you, you take care of, you got to take care of your basic needs, your survival, all those things um, before you can really heal on in, in the deeper ways. So it's, you know, I'm definitely not suggesting, you know, that, 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 is the answer for everything, you know, the healing of our trauma. It's like, well, first we need to get out of survival. <laughs> and so, yeah, we do need that parallel process where we're, 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 we're giving people the support they need. We're, we're giving, helping people have food and, and shelter and whatever, um, as we go in a, in a regenerative way. So, I mean, I'd love to see, see more of that actually in crisis zones and disaster zones is where we go in and like they're doing in the eco restoration camps. And that was one thing I was really, I'm really looking forward to talking with Joe about It's just, you know, and we had Joe, John Liu, you know, at the, uh, at the talk at the summit, you know, just about how these places of crisis and disaster and, and whatnot are, are opportunities for us to go in and, and start like, you know, let's put things in place in a different way. You know, let's let's start to create these new these new templates for people. You know, help restore the land. Re you know, build new natural community buildings and, and communities. Uh, alternative energy sources. Uh, teach people, you know, permaculture principles and help people start to grow their own food and like all these aspects of just surviving on the planet that we all know. We talk about in transition. It's like we have these opportunities, you know, in places where people just really have that need. And it's very, very real. And it's very, you know, like, yes, we need food right now. We need we need a house. So here's a really energy efficient, low cost way to do it. We know how to do that. And it's regenerative. <laughs> so and then at night, we'll sit around the fire and talk about our feelings, you know, <laughs> so. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And it, it brought to mind another idea. Um, I kind of lost my train of thought there for a second, but I'm, I'm actually no, I'm sorry. I went off a little bit on a <laughs> maybe. It was know, that's, that's, that's great. Um, I, I want to jump back to an idea much earlier in the conversation, if that's okay. Um, you asked the question um, about de-evolution um and you know what, what does evolution mean in that sense um and i wrote it down because i wanted to come back to that so for, for, from my perspective um the word de-evolution is is usually like completely unhelpful i, I don't use that word i, I think it, it only means anything relative to some specific value or trait that you're talking about um to me, evolution is a is a uh, um, uh, evolution can occur in ways that we value, and it can occur in ways that we would prefer not for it to occur. But no matter what, if it's progressing forward in time, it's evolution, um, and that, that's just the way that I use the word. And evolutionary systems um, tend to have trajectories, in a sense. Um, based on the conditions and the and the selection pressures in place, um, and then of course conditions and selection pressures evolve over time also. Um, but based on those conditions, um, evolutionary trajectories emerge in in almost. In fact, I think in all evolutionary systems, you have a trajectory towards complexity, um, meaning things. Uh, evolution evolves innovations, and then those innovations, um, because they work, they spread, and now you have a new field with which new innovations can happen piled on top of that and on top of that, and you get compounded things. And, um, and so there's, there's a trajectory of, of towards complexity and evolution, but there's all sorts of conditions that can arise um, where uh, the selection pressures are no longer in place um, 
so that there's there's a, a kind of um, you might call it a devolution, a, a collapse in um, stability or complexity happening in that in that system. So that, that's one thing about evolution. I have another thing, but go ahead, you quick. You want to say something first? Yeah, it was uh, it was making me think like de de evolution, like uh, like you're saying evolution is always. I, I'm not sure if you use the word always, but it's going towards complexity because I I, have, I can think of examples where it's going actually towards simplicity when it breaks down into, you know, but maybe that's where it's a de-evolution. I don't know. You know, that's that's an inter interesting thought. I'm sort of <laughs> thinking out loud here. Yeah, it's, it's complex to digest that thought um, and it's meaningful. I, I'll say that um, some of that is happening and, and also um, <clears throat> some of what's happening is that when I say evolutionary systems have a ten trend towards complexity, that doesn't mean that you won't find places in that system where there's microevolutionary trends towards simplicity. Um, but but the idea is that <clears throat> there is a there is a trend to when we say evolutionary systems have a trend towards complexity. What we really mean is that you will find more and more complex things arising in that ecosystem. It doesn't mean that that's going to happen to everything in the ecosystem. And, right, and, right. Okay. and it's actually characteristic of evolutionary systems that um, uh, and, and cultural evolution is, is slightly different than biological evolution, but there's plenty of similarities. It's characteristic that the, the older, simpler forms um, tend to stay around. Um, they, they, just because new, more complex forms evolve doesn't mean the older, they're built on the ecosystem of the simple ones. The simple ones don't go away. They just create a new substrate for more complex ones to then evolve on top of that. But there's a point where complexity breaks down. And that's, I mean, well, that's, I mean, now we're getting into complexity talk. And I, I know we, we need to kind of rein it back in because we're going to wrap it up here. But, but, um, but just one quick point is, and we could explore this further later in another conversation, but it's just, just that complexity and simplicity, I think is a really interesting <laughs> topic, but that at some point complexity becomes too much for the system and it breaks down. And that's where you have that reorganization reset. And then it, and then something new emerges and a new, a new configuration, a new system. And, um, so there is a kind of a simplicity that's in pl happening in that in that process i feel it's like the system's trying to simplify you know and and make it more orderly it's going towards order so uh but it, there's a breakdown and chaos that happens uh, uh that needs to happen before order and and we could say actually uh that's happening in our world right now <laughs> and culturally as well you know there's a chaos and a, a breakdown that's happening culturally and we as we have different cultures you know fighting or 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 affecting each other in good and bad ways um you know a lot of chaos a lot of a lot of a lot of confusion a lot of like well who who's who is what and what and uh you know like the ukraine russian war i mean you've got russians and you in ukraine and you know the the whole relationship between the two is not clean you know it's just so there's a lot of messiness in that in that cultural war but um but in general you know it's like there's this chaos and then it's like we want we want some order you know and i think that this is putin you know like try the dictator the feedback loop of russia you know is is, is produced a dictate dic, a, a line of dictators but it's like that that pressure of just like wanting to impose order you know what is that that's interesting you know it's like this it's like this um surrogate selection pressure of what naturally happens in the system of complexity where something breaks down into chaos and then this order emerges into a new system and a new a new uh web that that is orderly but um but if we have a, a dictator in a culture we have the, a, an unhealthy culture it tries to impose that order from outside when chaos is breaking out to stem off chaos and which subverts the natural process anyway that's just a thought off the top of my head right there which you got you <laughs> you're good for my good for my uh wild out there thinking galen <laughs> oh no that that felt all um yeah aligned and and certainly resonant um uh, one thing i want to say is that 
So in, in terms of the evolution versus de-evolution, de so like I say, you can use the word de-evolution in those, in those contexts. It's perfectly appropriate, and it's, you know, it's de-evolving relative to stability and complexity. Like, that's perfectly fair. But it's important when you zoom out, you'll realize that that's just a, a, a phase that you're looking at. And, and that um, the, the nature of evolutionary systems is uh, to go through bloom and collapse. And, um, you, you know, there, there have been m m uh, several major extinction events in the evolutionary history of, of life on Earth. Um, and I wouldn't say that uh, those were de-evolving events because the, the trajectory of evolution is that things have to get to a, a point where they eventually collapse themselves and then they reorganize and the thing that arises after that is more complex than the thing was before that is forward progression and evolution good point and in fact uh i like that yeah so it's framing the whole the whole cycle the cyclic uh, nature of things and honoring all aspects of the cycle birth and death and all that and I just like what I was talking about, like this, this surrogate evolution of the, the pressure based on a buildup of a unhealthy feedback loop. You know, cancer is another example. Cancer is like the unchecked growth, right? That's an unhealthy feedback loop. So we've got <laughs> cultural cancer, <laughs> if you want to call it that way. It's unhealthy growth that just takes over. And so I see kind of like a dictator like Putin is being and um, trying to impose order, you know, or, or you can give many, many examples of that, right? But um, that maybe could be what I call de-evolution when the evolutionary, the natural evolutionary process is, uh, is um, cut off from a, a surrogate pressure based on an unhealthy feedback loop from the culture. So I, I hear that, and I, I can appreciate those thoughts, and it's it's hard for me to, um, you know, the the words just aren't sufficient, um, for me to respond well to it. The one thing that I could say is that, um, I'm trying to word it in a way I, I completely agree with everything you said. So I don't want to make it sound like I'm disagreeing, but uh. I, I think it's really about there's there's different lenses to look through and uh, and and I'm wanting to be able to switch rapidly between the different lenses. So the one lens is like um, like you're absolutely right. Like this is a kind of a unnatural disruption of the of the process. And um, and I feel how that that, um, you know, feels like a de-evolution. Um, and that makes a lot of sense. And, and jumping into another lens. Uh, it's also true that um, the behaviors that the example we're using is Putin. We, we could use all sorts of examples. Um, the behaviors that, that Putin is presenting um, from this other lens uh, are themselves product of the system. It's completely natural evolution of the system and, and uh, in, in many ways is, is kind of predictable. Um, and, and in many ways, you know, is, is kind of um, uh, missing some of the points to kind of put all the blame on individual choice and decision making. Um, and uh, an idea that, that kind of connects with that a little bit that I wanted to go back from earlier, I also wrote this down. Um, we were talking about dictators earlier. And th there's this idea that, which I think is absolutely right, there's these selection pressures affecting individuals in a culture um, and you, you talked about Putin and how he's a product of that and his behaviors as a leader then exacerbate that and that's all totally true and we can't uh, I don't want to leave out the fact that Putin exists in a larger global cultural ecosystem and there are all sorts of selection pressures that his behaviors are responding to um, that that there's there's a you know we're in a we're in a we're in the current immature state of global geopolitical relations, um, and that has all of these 
kinds of effects. And it's real easy to just blame it on individuals and say, oh, if this real bad genocidal guy didn't come to power, everything would have been. But but the real thing is, why did that genocidal guy come to power? It's not just about the cultural dynamics in his culture. It's yeah. also about the global cultural dynamics well, selecting I, those behaviors. Absolutely. And I, I think that I spoke to that earlier when I was talking about, say, our president, you know, as being a product of our cultural norms and values is same thing with Putin. It's just that we give it a label. I, when I say Putin and it, for me, you know, just to clarify, it's, it's that element of that has been produced by a culture, you know, that has coalesced into this one person, you know, that, that becomes the enemy or becomes the, the, the mouthpiece for it. But it is a product of, of a lot of elements and, and, and absolutely. So a, I wanted to clarify that and agree with you. Um, but what I was trying to say is it's a feedback loop that they represent that feedback loop. And so what you're making me think is that like, well, I mean, I suppose if you wanted to frame the, if you wanted to widen the lens and make the frame even bigger, you could say, well, they're part of this breakdown of into chaos, you know, which is part of the natural evolution. But, you know, how far is that going to go before we blow up the planet? You know, it's just like, there's got to be some checks in place uh, for that chaotic energy and that that breakdown energy and war and all that stuff. It's like, come on, you know, it's like we 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 can't I don't think we need to create that level of chaos in our system through conflict all the time. But, um, you know, and I think that's our the maturity of the hu human species is to get to that place where it's like, oh, we you know, there's alternatives to this. <laughs> So I'm hoping that that is our next system <laughs> that but we are in the breakdown now and 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 it is part of that. So it, it, but I you know I I don't know if I want to I don't think I want to widen the frame so much to say that that's necessary and it's part of what we need to be doing to get to that um because a lot of people are suffering and and I just I I I'd like to think that we have alternatives and we have choices um to that that evolu that type of evolution <laughs> absolutely I, I think one of the reasons why talking about complexity science and evolution in um in the context of social systems human social systems um, one of the reasons it's so challenging um, is because there's this really meta layer of complexity when consciousness is involved and and so and that's why what i was saying earlier like the words are not sufficient it's like you got to jump from this frame to this frame rapidly um and and it and when you use language in this frame it sounds like it's contradicting the language of this frame but in reality it's not there's kind of like a, a non-duality nature to them um and and what i'm trying to say is that um uh, is that We, we have to think as part of the system, part of the natural dynamics of the collapse, the bloom and collapse that happens. In human systems, part of the natural dynamics are human choices. And of course we have a choice, and, and the choices that um, certain world leaders are making are a part of the natural dynamics of the system. And the choices that we are making to have this conversation and say, hey, we should be making other choices those are also part of the natural dynamics of the system. So it, it comes back to this way that like, our human minds are so trained to remove the human element from the system and think of us as separate. But really, all yeah. of our choices and behaviors are inherently a part of what the system is doing. Yeah, yeah, no, that's good. You're bringing, you're speaking, yeah, I mean, that's the whole, the whole thing about bringing us back to our bodies and our healing. That's part of the healing. Is, is exactly what you said, is just like remembering that we are, we are part of this, we are doing this as we talk about it. So thank you for being, and that's a really good place to end because that, that feels like we did full circle there. <laughs> that, I mean, in a way, if you, can, if you can, I mean, more like a spiral actually, because <laughs> there's lots of, lots of other threads that, that we could come back to and, and I hope that we will. But uh, we're gonna cap it off there for this this session, and um, it's 
obviously could keep going and it will. So come back to our next uh, next month and um, and we'll let you all know if you if you email at uh, um, admin at era of care dot net. A D I M at era of care. E R A O F C A R E dot net. If you are interested in learning about when we're doing our podcasts or any other things we're doing, we do live events, Zooms, um, gatherings. Uh, we have a monthly community practice. We've got um, a lots of great things cooking and coming up. So if you if you email us, you'll uh, get to um, get on our uh, announcement list, and and you can go to our website at innerresilience.net to learn more as well. And uh, we hope to hope hope that you'll join this community. We're we're fairly new, as you can see on YouTube. We, we we're still growing, just beginning growing. <laughs> so join us. Um, join this movement of trying to build a healing healing communities within the wider regenerative movement, so that we can really um, so that we really can evolve, <laughs> right? <laughs> in a good way, in a positive, healthy way. So. Um, thanks, Galen. That was an awesome conversation with you, as always, and I look forward to more. You, you have any, want to say any last words? Um, yeah, just I, I very much look forward to more, and I have in mind a couple of threads I feel like I left loose, and so I'll be, I'll be excited to come back to it. And also, for anybody that's interested, um, I'm uh, just recently up on Medium. I'm writing articles uh, about regeneration and it's a great article about what is regeneration and the qualities of regenerative systems. And you can check that out at Medium. Uh, my name is Galen Myers, and uh, there's a publication called The Regenerative Transition on Medium. Awesome. I'm, I didn't know that. I'm going to check it out. And it's I have a video. Of but, you know, in the, in the description for the video, we'll put all our info so they can see it. So thank you all. And thank you, Galen. So good to have you. And We'll see you next time, and hopefully Joe will be here next time. We'll let you all know. I can't wait. Thank you.